committee will come to order. Good morning and thank you for being here. The Interior Department is responsible for the regulation and oversight of offshore oil drilling. Unfortunately, the BP oil spill followed a long history of regulatory and ethical failures at the Interior Department and its Minerals Management Service, better known as MMS. The De Deepwater Horizon disaster has now exposed what appears to be continuing major problems at MMS. Over the last decade, MMS has essentially permitted the oil industry to police itself. For example, in 2000, MMS issued an alert requiring oil companies to have a backup system to activate blowout preventers. One of the components that failed contributed to the Deepwater Horizon explosion and exacerbated the size of the oil spill. But MMS officials decided to let oil industry executives determine how they wanted to comply with this requirement. In other words, BP and the other oil companies were essentially on the honor system. The Deepwater Horizon disaster suggests this is not an effective approach to ensuring safe offshore drilling. Regulatory failures at MMS were made worse by the rapid growth of offshore oil drilling in the Gulf. Over the last two decades, the number of offshore oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico has expanded dramatically and extended further offshore into much deeper waters. Yet at the same time, MMS remains relatively small had trouble recruiting qualified engineers and inspectors and could not keep up. Though drilling has expanded in the Gulf by tenfold, the number of inspectors has only grown by 13 percent. The results, fewer than 60 inspectors are currently responsible for conducting over 18,000 inspections annually. The agency was born with a built-in conflict of interest. When MMS was created, it was given the dueling responsibilities of promoting drilling and collecting royalty payments on the one hand, while also issuing and enforcing environmental and safety regulations on the other hand. It seems as though it was only a matter of time before these conflicting responsibilities would lead to the disaster we are seeing here today. In short, it was a tug of war between drilling and safety. As the BP disaster illustrates, safety found itself on the losing side of the struggle. Even worse, regulatory failures have been accompanied by ethical failures. In 2008, the Interior Department Inspector General found a culture of ethical failures within MMS royalty in kind program. The IG's investigation revealed that over a four year period, senior employees within MMS improperly accepted gifts and engaged in sex and drug abuse with all company employees. Unfortunately, this was not an isolated incident. Just last month, the IG released another report which found that inspectors improperly accepted gifts from oil companies. Additionally, at least one employee simultaneously conducted inspections of an oil company's operation while negotiating employment with the very same company. In addition, in a series of reports, GAO found that flaws in royalty collections have resulted in millions of dollars in lost revenue. We can and must do a better job overseeing offshore oil and gas activities. Today, we will hear directly from the Secretary and Mr. Bromwich about how exactly they plan to implement the reorganization 
and increase oversight and accountability at MMS, which we are anxious and eager to hear. Before we begin, however, I want to make one final observation. While the Interior Department is responsible for regulating the oil industry, and they have been taking a lot of heat for that, it does not change the fact that BP was responsible for the safety of its oil well, and BP was responsible in terms of responding to the oil spill. And it is BP that is ultimately responsible for the entire cleanup and the cost, as well as the job losses and loss income resulting from the spill. I am committed to ensure, ensuring that the government has the authority and ability to effectively regulate the safety of offshore oil drilling. And on that note, I now yield five minutes to the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing. Five years ago, we began looking at failures in the Gulf and more. In, in light of Hurricane Katrina, we knew that this was a sensitive area and one that would struggle for years to come and one that was vulnerable to failures by the Federal Government in just an area or two. And whether it's the, the levees that failed to protect the people of, of New Orleans or the plan approved by Mineral Management Service that failed to even consider the possibility that oil could come ashore in a, in a disaster of this size, we, the Federal Government, have failed. Every day, every American hears somewhere, it seems, that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. There were two weak links that led to this disaster. British Petroleum acting irresponsibly, failing to maintain safety standards well established in the industry, failing to maintain their own safety standards, and being in too big a hurry to cut corners, cut cost, ultimately leading to the loss of life and the loss of billions of dollars to the American people around the Gulf and beyond. But there was another weak link, a well-noted weak link, one that this committee has been pursuing change for almost six years now from, Mineral Management Service, an organization that has checks and balances that mean nothing. Years ago, we discovered that when a contract was, was signed, person after person after person was required to initial it. They initialed it and nothing else. They did not read it. They did not verify. They did not ask any questions. That kind of absence does not just go to the engineers that are hard to recruit. It goes to the very top of the organization and has under multiple administrations. In fact, problems in our first uh, set of hearings go all the way back to the Clinton administration. But let us make it very clear. Those problems were well known during the entire Bush administration, and for those eight years, change did not occur. Sadly, Mr. Secretary, during the year and a half of your administration, change did not occur. I know that it seems like a very little bit of time, but if, if in fact, the 20 or so findings that have occurred by your own IGs and GAO had been put together with the work of this committee sooner and the urgency put onto it, I believe this could have been prevented. Having said that, we need to look to the future. We need to look to real change in the Mineral Management Service. I personally would not like to see it broken into three even smaller parts, but rather have the real focus either as an independent agency or as one that has the, a level of clarity to the American people much, si much more similar to the EPA. We need to have that. We need to have the American people understand that the proper revenue that has not come to the American people is a factor. The proper controls and, ch and safeguards are a factor. Chairman Waxman, Mr. Kucinich, and Mr. Towns, and the rest of us have all seen hearings but we haven't seen the amount of hearings that we should have had, and we haven't had the follow-up by previous administrations or, to date, by your administration. I believe that there are a number of factors that we can deal with today that have to do with the current disaster. 
with a number of, of, of factors, including a, if you will, an overstatement of available resources, an overreporting of available resources and when they were there, and a number of other areas. Those occurred under your watch. But ultimately, this is the Committee of Oversight and Reform. And it's those published 20 reports that we want to deal with primarily. It's the discovery of documents that will allow us to take a first hand in the reorganization to ensure that when this is over with, we can count on an agency that recruits and trains the kind of second guessers to an oil industry. I think it's important to note that there are many, many, many rigs that have been operated safely and responsibly. It only takes one operating irresponsibly and then a lack of oversight. In fact, to, the, to my amazement, the last inspection by Mineral Management Service of this rig before the disaster occurred as required with two individuals, two being part of the inspection team. That was because there was a requirement to have two separate people independently second-guessing each other. To my amazement, of course, it was a father-son team and, in, in fact, less likely to be independent. This is one of many too cozy relationships at MMS that have to change. This has to be an organization of professionals, not a family practice. <clears throat> the American people want us to take care of a number of items, but they want us to go further. I will note today that four other or major oil companies have announced an investment and in the construction of a very large dome designed to work in the Gulf, uh, certainly on our part of the Gulf, but perhaps in Brazil and other areas if a similar event happens. This kind of proactive thinking is important. And in fact, Mr. Secretary, to the extent that you've been involved in it, either by urging or demanding, I'd like to personally applaud you. I believe that when we look at the blow-off blow preventers, next generation, something that's been needed since 2003, and we look at the recovery and response assets, not just for this event, but for any event, for a major shipwreck, a hurricane that destroys a refinery, or even chemical failures, we all have a responsibility to see that we go with a program much more similar to putting a man on the moon than simply business as usual in the Gulf. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to an extensive hearing today. I look forward to the balance of our discovery, and I look forward to working with you on trying to oversee for over the next couple of years the real birth of an organization unlike the old MMS and much more like an organization that we can all be assured will keep the good actors doing what they're supposed to and the bad actors all together out of the business. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Yeah, um, I'll also now recognize for three minutes the gentleman who is the chair of the subcommittee from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing on offshore drilling. Will Interior's reforms change its history of failed oversight? Uh, it's important that we do our work of, of oversight. But I also have to tell you that while I'm sitting here looking at the preparation for the hearing and thinking about how we're going to focus on things, for example, I'm going to have some questions, you can think about it now, about the Atlantis platform, how 19 members of Congress wrote to uh, the um, Mineral Management Service back in February, raising questions about engineering documents about question and didn't get the answers that we were entitled to. The um, breach and the catastrophe occurred with Deepwater Horizon, but the questions that we raised with respect to the Atlantis platform were, were, were relevant not only to Atlantis, but Deepwater Horizon and other uh, platforms that are out there in the Gulf. But as I'm, and so we're going to get into that in the Q&A. But, but I, I just have to say something about, um, about this moment. There seems to be some feeling in this country that we can endlessly invade the natural world without any consequences. Well, the, the catastrophe in the Gulf put the lie to that. But we still believe we can do it. But we're still moving forward with people, you know, talking about doing more drilling, and we, we built our whole economy around this. 
And so, Mr. Secretary, you're, you're being asked to, uh, to defend a system which truly is basically collapsing, really is. And I thank you for your service, but the fact of the matter is the system itself is collapsing. We, we think we can keep interfering in the natural world without any consequences. We think we can postpone the delivery or the development of alternative energies. We think we can keep on living in this country the way we've been living uh, without any correction in our course, uh, even in the face of a tremendous catastrophe in the Gulf. Well, we're going to have to start thinking again. Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen from Ohio. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Micah, for three minutes. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chairman Towns uh, for and uh, Mr. Issa for convening this uh, hearing. I'm pleased to see the uh, Secretary here. Uh, there are some very serious uh, questions that need to be answered about what took place and also what measures we have uh, in place to deal with the, the current uh, spill uh, that, you know, I see from Florida around the, the Gulf Coast affecting people's life, the moratorium. We have, we've got so many questions, but I'm pleased that you're here uh, to, to hopefully uh, shed some light on it, your colleague. Uh, Mr. Isis stated that we, we knew something was rotten in the uh, Mineral Management Service, even under the Bush administration. And I'll put in the record a copy of a letter that uh, that cites uh, three criminal investigations were launched during the Bush administration on that agency, uh, things uh, uh, we knew there, there were problems with. I, I'd like to know from you when you inherited that position if that was one of your focuses. There are other, uh, other questions that have been raised about the development of policy with the new administration. And you know, I, th I think a lot of people voted for uh, President Obama and the other side, they thought they were the protectors of the environment and all this. And it turns out that they were asleep uh, at the uh, uh, switch. Uh, and what, what baffles me is how you could come up with uh, proposals to, and, and I want to know if you were consulted on this budget proposal in 2011 to cut the Coast Guard uh, budget, which is one of the first responders when you, whenever you have an, uh, uh, an oil uh, incident or a disaster in this country. Uh, in addition, $2 million cut from uh, MMS, uh, Mineral Management uh, Services budget uh, for environmental reviews. It's in here. These were proposals. I don't know if you uh, had anything to do with this in February uh, of this year. And then, uh, this is February, and then in March, the administration develops a policy. Here's the headline from the New York Times, Obama to open offshore drilling, uh, offshore areas to oil drilling, and it cites the, the Gulf uh, of Mexico. Uh, so here we're cutting the assets and uh, those responsible for oversight and permitting. Uh, and there are questions about the rubber stamping uh, carte blanche of the approval. This is the approval signed by your administration uh, to drill in deep water. And then the, the rush to go do more deep water drilling. This is the list of 33 approvals that by the Obama administration. There's only a total of 27 deep water operations in the Gulf. Half of those are exploratory, half approximately production. But your rush to more drilling uh, and cutting uh, the assets. I think I'd like to know how this policy was developed and if you had any part in it or what the thinking was when they, uh, when they took time this is pack. So I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, let me um, indicate that it's a long-standing policy of this committee that we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer. I do. Yes. So you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We're delighted to have uh, Secretary Salazar with us. Uh, he's serving as the 50th Secretary of the United States Department of Interior. 
Prior to his confirmation, Secretary Salazar served as a senator from the great state of Colorado. Before becoming senator, Secretary Salazar spent two terms as Colorado's attorney general and served as chief legal counsel and executive director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources in the cabinet of Governor Roy Romer. Welcome, and we are aware of your time constraints and we will respect them, no question about it. And then Mr. Michael Bromwich was sworn in as and to lead the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulations and Enforcement, formerly known as MMS. On June the 21st, 2010, Director Bromwich previously served as Inspector General for the Department of Justice and as an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. Most recently, Director Bromwich was a partner at the law firm uh, Freed of and, and, and Frank, where he specialized in conducting internal investigations. We welcome both of you. Uh, at this time, I ask that each witness deliver their testimony within five minutes, which will allow the committee ample time to raise questions and also considering your time constraints, uh, Secretary. Uh, of course, we, you know the rules that um, they start out, the lights on green, and then, of course, you know, because uh, you, you know all about these lights. And um, then all of a sudden, they <laughs> I'm not caution. sure the Senate knows about these lights, <laughs> really. Senate, oh, oh, that's another issue. <laughs> but then, and then all of a sudden, at the end, it becomes red. So, Mr. Secretary, you may begin. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman uh, Towns. And uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Issa, and uh, all the members, uh, distinguished members of the committee who are here. Uh, and at the outset, let me just say, Thank you to the committee for the work that it has done uh, in the prior years relative to putting uh, into the spotlight uh, some of the necessary reform efforts uh, that uh, are required of the Minerals Management Service, uh, many of those uh, which we have been working on uh, since day one uh, when I became Secretary of the Interior. Let me at the outset just say to the members of the committee, I know you are uh, all wondering about the status of uh, where we are with respect to the containment of uh, the oil leak out in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, since uh, day one, and today is uh, day plus 93, we have been working from uh, early morning till uh, late at night, making sure that uh, the entire arsenal of the United States of America is focused on the problem and getting it resolved. Uh, myself and Secretary Chu, other members of the Cabinet uh, have been working on this uh, from day one. And as of today, uh, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there is a shut-in uh, that has occurred of the well, and uh, the monitoring that we have required of BP is uh, showing that uh, it is holding. Uh, but the weather patterns that we are seeing may have some interruption in terms of getting to the ultimate solution here, which is uh, the ultimate uh, kills that have to occur of this well. Uh, but uh, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Let me uh, move to the subject uh, area that uh, I think this committee wants to explore, and that's uh, the issue of responsibility and uh, what is it that uh, has happened here. Let me frame it for this committee the way that I see it. Uh, this is a collective responsibility, and I do not uh, believe that at the end of the day uh, that the blame game is going to help us uh, relative to how we move forward and uh, develop the broad energy portfolio and the comprehensive energy plan that is uh, required of America. That we need to work together uh, to uh, fix the problem, uh, make sure we learn the lessons from this incident, and that we move forward with uh, an energy portfolio that I think uh, at the end of the day uh, will include oil and gas. Uh, that has been the position of uh, the President and my position as Secretary of Interior. In terms of the responsibility for this incident that brings us here today, certainly BP and other companies that were involved have uh, broken the rules and have strayed from the best practices of the industry. Uh, many investigations are going on. Much of that has already been reported in the press. Secondly, uh, industry uh, has made uh, the wrong representations, uh, both to the Congress as well as uh, to the Department of Interior and, and others, with respect to drilling safety, with respect to the ability to contain blowouts, and with respect to oil spill response. The efforts announced yesterday by the four major companies and moving forward with a billion-dollar effort on which I was briefed 
will need significant additional work uh, before we can be satisfied with at least one of those uh, particular prongs that I think are uh, essential to be righted. Uh, thirdly, the Congress shares the responsibility. This committee has been at the forefront at least of ex exposing some of the ethical lapses. But at the end of the day, uh, the drilling that has occurred and the deep water drilling has been something which this Congress has also embraced. And I recognize that I, too, was a member of the U.S. Senate, uh, the passage of the 2005 Energy Policy Act, which uh, you, Congressman Ice, and other members of this committee voted on, essentially was part of a national framework. Uh, fourth, there is a reality that this is uh, an issue which uh, requires uh, looking back not just at uh, one administration, but it's multiple administrations. The MMS was formed in 1981, and you think about the fact that there have been Republican and Democratic administrations that essentially have allowed this organization to continue by fiat of secretarial order. And it was for that reason that even as uh, early as last year, I proposed uh, to the uh, Natural uh, Resources Committee, uh, sent, uh, Congressman Ray House Committee, that we move forward with organic legislation because the missions of this department are, of, of this agency are so important. Let me, um, so let me just say it's a shared responsibility uh, and uh, we need to move forward and, and fix the problems. I believe that we started uh, in my tenure as Secretary of Interior moving forward implementing the reform agenda, much of which had been uncovered through some of the work of this committee. On ethics, uh, from day one, we put together a strong and robust ethics program uh, working uh, with the findings of the Inspector General and uh, moving forward to clean up the corruption that occurred, occurred in Lakewood and other places. People have been fired, people have been sent over for cr criminal, criminal prosecution, people have been suspended, and we've done everything that we can uh, to clean house from an ethics point of view. We eliminated the Royalty and Kind program, which had existed for a long time and which had been one of the magnets uh, for corruption that has been eliminated. And we move forward with a comprehensive review and uh, change with respect to the Outer Continental Shelf Plan that had been proposed by the prior administration. And finally, we have uh, worked very hard to uh, stand up uh, the renewable energy resources uh, out in the oceans of, of, of America. Uh, with respect to what has happened since April 20th and how we move forward uh, with that reform agenda, it's a continuing effort. We've uh, proposed uh, and developed a report on safety to the President of the United States. It was a 30-day report that laid out a number of different measures from blowout prevention uh, mechanisms to moving with cement, cementing and casing and, and the like. We have proposed in the last two years' budgets uh, uh, efforts to, to, to expand the uh, number of inspectors that we have at MMS. And we're moving forward with the reorganization of the MMS now into the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Enforcement and Regulation. And that is being done under the leadership of Wilma Lewis and uh, Michael Bromwich. Let me just say that both of them have incredible uh, credentials as prosecutors as well as inspector generals. Uh, and they were chosen by me to run the agency in large part because of the ethical improprieties which this committee and which the Inspector General uh, had uncovered. And so we have been working hard on making sure that those ethical lapses are not there, and we understand that there's still significant reform that we have to undertake in the days and months ahead, and we will be focused on it like laser beam and look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Issa, and members of this committee to make sure that the new organization ultimately gets it right. Let me uh, finally say, I know some of you will have questions on the moratorium. I will be delighted to answer those questions. And finally, uh, just in terms of what I hope the legacy of this crisis is, I would hope that as we learn the lessons from this crisis, that at the end of the day we'll look back at this time and we'll say that we have together as a nation developed safer oil and gas production in the outer continental shelf that does in fact protect the environment and protect the safety of the workers. I would hope that we can move forward as a nation and say that we have restored the Gulf Coast to a place that it's in a better condition than it was before April 20th. And I would hope that we are able to move forward and embrace uh, the new energy future of America with a much broader portfolio that includes uh, solar and wind and geothermal and all the rest of the portfolio that is part of the renewable energy initiative of President Obama and uh, members of this Congress. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your statement. Uh, Mr. Bromovich. Thank you very much, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and other distinguished members of the committee. It's a pleasure to to be here and to uh, testify before you and to uh, answer any questions you may have. Uh, as the Chairman noted and as the Secretary noted, uh, I'm new on this job. I've been in the job uh, exactly a month yesterday uh, as head of the 
newly renamed Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. Uh, the change in, of name was made by Secretary Salazar uh, with a point, which was to stress and emphasize the regulation and enforcement part of the organization's mission that many people have fairly suggested has been ignored or neglected uh, in the past. Let me focus very briefly on, on three things that uh, we've been doing since I got there. Uh, number one, on the second day uh, after I was named director with Secretary Salazar's approval, we created an in investigations and review unit uh, within the organization uh, that will have several primary functions, but uh, the principal function will be some self-policing. Uh, it will be authorized in conjunction, cooperation, and communication with the Office of the Inspector General to do investigations into ethical lapses, into misconduct, uh, and so forth. To my surprise, there, has not, there had not been that capability within the organization previously. I believe that any healthy and robust organization should have that capability. This organization now has that. Uh, second, th that unit, the Investigations and Review Unit, uh, will spearhead an inf in a heightened enforcement program that will be focused on oil and gas companies uh, and that will launch aggressive investigations in those cases in which there are allegations that the rules have been violated. Too often in the past, I've heard and I fear uh, enforcement has not been vigilant, it has not been aggressive. That will change. Finally, uh, as, as the ranking member and the chairman noted, there have been many, many uh, reviews and investigations by various entities, including the Office of the Inspector General, GAO, and so forth. One of the duties of the inv this investigations and review unit will be to follow up on those reviews to see whether the remedial steps that should have been taken and where statements that may have been made that those remedial steps had been taken, whether they in fact have been taken. So that kind of follow-up work will be a central mission uh, of the investigations and review unit. Next subject I'd like to talk, uh, touch on briefly are the new regulations uh, that uh, have already been implemented and that will be implemented in the future. Following the uh, Deepwater Horizon blowout and the 30-day safety report that the Secretary mentioned, a, a new safety regulation, NTL-5, was issued that is binding on the industry. That was followed by the issuance of NTL-6, which is a more environmentally oriented regulation. Uh, these are tough new rules and regulations that govern uh, oil and gas companies as they do work uh, in the Outer Continental Shelf, uh, and I think they are fair and appropriate uh, new rules and regulations. There are other rulemakings that are in process that are in part the product of learning that has gone on in the Interior Department, uh, both previously and that is going on in an accelerated way over the last two months, and we hope to be putting out those rules in the near future. Uh, again, uh, I think we, we feel that those are necessary and appropriate. Finally, the Secretary mentioned briefly uh, the moratorium. One of the charges he gave me in connection with the moratorium issued on July 12th uh, was to conduct a series of public forums around the country to gather information on three central issues, drilling safety, spill containment, and spill response, with an eye to gathering as much information from industry, from academia, uh, from stakeholders, from NGOs, from environmental groups to determine uh, whether there are ways in which the moratorium might be shortened uh, uh, before the November 30th current expiration date, but generally to learn as much as we can on what additional measures need to be taken on those three dimensions to ensure that when deep water drilling is resumed, it's done in a safe and appropriate manner. Um, we will begin those meetings starting August 4th in New Orleans. Uh, we will follow those with a series of meetings in Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, Santa Barbara, California, Anchorage, Alaska, Biloxi, Mississippi, Houston, Texas, and Lafayette, Louisiana. Those will be conducted uh, between uh, August 4th and September 15th with a call to report back to Secretary Salazar with the results of those public forums no later than October 31st. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of important work, uh, and we look forward to doing it, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your, your statement. Um, let me begin by uh, Secretary Salazar. Will you commit today that the reorganization process will be transparent and this committee will be provided with all the critical details? 
Yes, uh, we will uh, absolutely be working uh, with the committee, with uh, members of Congress uh, relative to uh, legislation on the reorganization as well as uh, the uh, keeping you up to date on the implementation of the new organization. Now, the reorganization, I want to know how will the reorganization help to prevent further future disasters? Well, first, in terms of dealing with uh, some of the ethical lapses, which uh, I agree have been abhorrent in the past and which this committee has appropriately pointed out, as well as uh, our uh, Inspector General in the Department of Interior, we are dividing up the agency into different units. So the revenue functions of the former, what were formerly in the MMS, will move over into a, an Office of Natural Resources Revenue. So the the dollar collectors will be separated from those who are in charge of granting the leases and doing the enforcement. The rest of the agency, which uh, uh, Director Bromwich will oversee, will be split into a bureau that essentially manages the resource uh, out in the outer continental shelf, both uh, conventional as well as renewable, and another unit that essentially will be in charge of safety and enforcement. So that's the essential concepts uh, around the reorganization to ensure, first of all, that conflicts of interest are avoided in the future, the kinds that you have pointed out in your investigations, and second of all, that uh, there is a kind of enforcement with respect to safety and environmental requirements. Right. You know, um, the GAO and, of course, DOI, IG, have made numerous recommendations to improve royalty collection. Have you implemented any of these recommendations or up to this point? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the answer to that is uh, we, we have in uh, major ways relative to the elimination of the royalty in kind program. We were also looking at other ways in which uh, we can provide a, uh, a more effective uh, calculation of, uh, of royalties and have been working at uh, putting together a program so that the American taxpayer receives uh, the return from the royalties uh, or from oil and gas production that the American taxpayer deserves. Let me ask you, um, have you looked at the turnover process in terms of people that work for MMS, you know, moving on based on the um, fact that they're so poorly paid? We, uh, you know, the, the revolving door issue is one that uh, has troubled us and one that uh, we are uh, working on. Uh, you know, it is my personal view that if you have been an MMS uh, director that you ought not to go out and then work with uh, uh, the, the, the industry. Uh, but I, I will have uh, Michael Bromwich, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just quickly answer that question because it's something that we have been focused on. Sure. I think it's a serious issue and a serious problem. There have been historical problems in recruiting qualified inspectors and many of the qualified inspectors do come from industry and then seem to want to go back to industry. Now, it's my view that we can do a couple of things about that. One is to create tighter rules to ensure that uh, if people who are uh, agency government inspectors do go back into the private sector, that at least they, they don't uh, deal directly with the agency that they just left on any of the matters that they worked on and for some period of time perhaps not deal with the agency at all. So that's one set of issues that we're in the process of addressing. I think a more fundamental issue, though, is how do you enlarge the pool of qualified inspectors? One of the things that, that I've begun conversations about is talking to some of the schools of engineering around the country to see if we can develop recruiting programs so that this becomes a desirable uh, public service career path. Let's recruit the best and the brightest out of some of the petroleum engineering schools around the country, people who have no prior uh, ties with industry, and let's make it a sustainable career path so that they're not tempted by more dollars in the private sector, but they can make a decent living serving as a qualified uh, inspector. So I, I had a conversation yesterday with the, the dean of the School of Engineering at UC Berkeley. He said there are a number of schools of engineering deans around the country who are interested in working with us on precisely this point. So we're at the very beginning stages of this, but I'm very hopeful that we will have some robust alternatives to the back and forth revolving door system that has existed up until now. That's very encouraging. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd like to do just a little technical housework. Mr. Secretary, 
your staff up until last night told us that there was a policy which they would not provide in writing that you only delivered document requests to the majority and then the majority has been kindly making copies and giving them to us however under ranking member Waxman and the Bush administration we never saw such a policy and we were not able to get it in writing would you pledge that both the rest of the discovery would be coming which you've already said before the committee hearing started but also that that the discovery would be transparent to both sides, that uh, the chairman may have requests that are slightly different than we have, but that what we request would be granted to both sides at the same time, rather than relying on somebody to go through and try to make a, a, an effective copy, rather than your knowing that you delivered both sides the same information. Uh, Congressman uh, Issa, we uh, delivered uh, thousands of pages of, of documents, uh, both to the chairman as well as to you, and we're working uh, with you to try to get all the additional documents. We no, sent a package yesterday. And I appreciate yesterday. Your, your, your participation and your, your promising that. It was actually more technical than that. Until last night, any documents we got, we got because they were delivered to the majority and not to the minority, and the majority then made copies. And that's not a normal practice from government. Uh, each of us has independent requests, uh, and usually they're shared by delivering them either to the person who requested them, if only one requested, but in most cases, administration delivers to both sides so that both sides know exactly what's being delivered. This was troubling, and particularly when last night your folks suddenly changed in probably because you were going to be here and, and gave us both copies. We'd like to know that that would continue, that, that each of us would get information independently but, but copied to the other. Congressman. Uh, I said, let me just say that we will uh, follow the processes that the Department of Justice and others have uh, required of the executive branch of government. My view is that uh, transparency is important. Uh, we have provided tremendous documents uh, to this committee and will continue to work with you to provide you the information that you need so that uh, you have uh, absolute information relative to what it is that you're seeking. Okay, I, I won't belabor the point. I'll trust that if you gave it to us directly last night, you're probably going to continue giving it to us directly uh, and not the way your staff had decided to do it prior to that time. Uh, the, uh, the questions uh, I have are a number, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the, uh, the culture at MMS, we can talk about changing, Mr. Bromwich. I, I'm looking forward to your helping change that. But in our earlier investigations, one of the things we discovered was that not only was this organization cozy, it was inept. We had testimony and evidence that you're now what you own, or maybe what you own, Mr. Secretary, the portion that was collecting the money completely relied on the energy companies to deliver how much was owed from where, that there was no independent accounting and that no audit ever basically found a different number, meaning if uh, Kerr McGee, when they were still in business, said we got X amount out and delivered X amount of dollars, they just took the money and, and recorded it, that they had no independent ability to know whether that was the right number or not. Do you, one or both of you, have plans to implement a system so that you can independently discover how much oil or natural gas or other resources are being taken out? and verify them, not just take the word of the good players and the bad players alike? The answer to that, Congressman I is yes, and uh, we have already done it in indeed with uh, BP. We just sent them a notice for some, I think, $5 million uh, with respect to royalty underpayments uh, in, uh, on an onshore activity. And secondly, with respect to the Office of Natural uh, Resource uh, Revenue, which uh, we have created. Uh, there will be the auditing uh, function so that we can do that independent verification and perhaps Director Bromwich may want to comment on that as well. I agree with you, uh, Congressman Issa. That's, a, that's an inappropriate and unacceptable system. The uh, Secretary has just said that that's been changed and that that's absolutely the right way to do it. You cannot re rely on the regulated entity to report without checking that, auditing it, and coming up with an independent assessment. I appreciate that. And very quickly, uh, the uh, – I might suggest that uh, every year the Army Corps of Engineers has huge amounts of senior engineers retire who still would like to work for government. I would hope that you look at both ends of the spectrum, those coming directly out of uh, universities that have never worked with oil companies, but perhaps senior engineers who have uh, 5, 10, or 15 more good years to give that also 
do, are not tainted by an ambition to work for seven figures for an oil company? I think that's a great idea. Last week I found out that there may be a pool of people in the Coast Guard, I think they're called warrant officers, who similarly have uh, useful experience that we, yeah. can, we can count on. So I think there are actually pockets of experienced personnel all over government uh, that people just haven't thought of tapping into in the past, but that we're going to try to tap into now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I indicated in my opening remarks that I had some questions about the uh, way that the Minerals Management Service handled the uh, British Petroleum's Atlantis platform uh, issues in the Gulf of Mexico. I was one of 19 members of Congress who signed a letter to uh, the Mineral Management Service uh, back in February of 2010. Uh, this was about uh, Mr. Bromwich. This was uh, about two months before the Deepwater Horizon incident. Uh, Ms. Birnbaum, the former director, received a letter uh, about VP Atlantis's platform. We requested an investigation to verify a whistleblower claim that 90 percent of the final construction plans for the platform, almost 7,000 plans, were never approved. So if there is an accident in that rig, there would be no plans for response teams to use to try to deal with it. Uh, though I am happy to see that an investigation is now underway, I am concerned that it is not expected to conclude until September. It is important to keep in mind that this platform is in waters deeper than the deep water horizon platform. And BP's own worst case scenario for a catastrophe with Atlantis would put over 200,000 barrels of oil per day into the Gulf, which is about anywhere from four to ten times the size of the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe. My first question, Mr. Bromwich, is whether BP would be found in violation of the law if it does not maintain certified as-built drawings on file. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Let me get back to you on that. My intuition, uh, is, that the answer, my intuition that is that the answer I'm disappointed you don't have the answer to that because that's your job. The answer, I'll give you the answer, the answer would be yes. Now, I'm told that it should not take that long to review the plans. That raises a question that the plans might not even exist. I'm concerned that Atlantis is the rule and not the exception. Given what we know about the Horizon accident and how BP Atlantis does not have engineer certified documents for its subsea components as required by law, wouldn't it make sense for the Bureau for Ocean Energy Management, Regulation and Enforcement to close the Atlantis project as well as any deep water drilling production operations in the Gulf that lack final plans until an independent third party has proven that they are operating with complete sets of engineer approved drawings for their above and below sea components. Mr. Bromwich. Um, Congressman, you are correct that there is an investigation uh, ongoing. Uh, you are also correct that it is going to be completed by the end of September. Uh, I am advised that there is a letter that is on its way to me that will update you and other members, uh, interested members of the committee with what I anticipate will be preliminary results of that investigation. The truth is I have spent the bulk of the month uh, since I came on board dealing with various offshoots of the Deepwater Horizon matter, and so I am not as fully aware of the Atlantis matter as you would like me to be, but I will make it my business to become more knowledgeable about it and be happy to talk to you further about it in the near future. Uh, Mr. Bromwich, I appreciate that response, but I think it would be useful for you to review the letter that was sent back in February, February 20, 2010, signed by 19 members of Congress, including myself, which provides a very powerful warning about the consequences of not having uh, an appropriate inspection of the issue relating to engineering plans at that uh, BP Atlantis platform. I will review that. You, you understand the concern. I mean, we, we're you are dealing with a catastrophe 
from the lack of appropriate oversight at Deepwater Horizon. What I'm maintaining to you and what other members of Congress have, we've all joined together in asserting is that uh, lack of appropriate oversight also exists with respect to a BP Atlantis platform, which could have even more catastrophic uh, implications uh, than uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster. I thank the gentleman. I yield back. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman uh, Kucinich, I would uh, want to just uh, supplement to what uh, Director Bromwich said by saying, one, uh, the investigation is underway and he will uh, keep you uh, posted as to the results of the investigation. Number two, we have uh, sent inspectors uh, out into the Gulf to look at uh, the uh, drilling uh, as well as the production uh, platforms, and so there's an ongoing inspection effort underway. And number three, one of the things that should come out of the lessons learned here is that you cannot have uh, 60 inspectors essentially having the responsibility of conducting the massive uh, job that has been assigned uh, to these inspectors, and that is why there is a budget amendment in front of this Congress to try to beef up uh, the level of, of, of inspection and, and investigation capability within Mr. the agency. Mr. Chairman, yeah. I, I, I just want this committee to be on notice that we've got to find out whether BP has certified as built drawings on file. This is a, this is a serious matter, especially in light of Deepwater Horizon. Thank you. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Micah. Well, thank you. Uh, again, we appreciate your being here, Mr. Secretary. I raised some questions in my couple of minutes of opening statement. Um, and I think everyone has to be baffled by the administration's development of policy. You were one of the first people nominated, I think, ba back by the President. People were pleased. You know, we had somebody from the Congress and your experience in the position. So you came in in 2009. You had an opportunity to develop bu budget and policy, I would imagine. and. Um, I was kind of shocked again when the staff gave me the budget and uh, it showed cuts like $2 million in the mineral management environmental permit activity that, that was proposed by your agency. Did you participate in making decisions on that or uh, again, the, the primary agency for response in these kinds of disasters would be the Coast Guard. Uh, the administration proposed 1,100 uh, positions cut cutting assets, uh, ships, planes, helicopters, all the things that you would use uh, in a response. W were you part of the decision to make those cuts, either in your agency, uh, maybe not Coast Guard? You know, Congressman Micah, with respect to uh, the budget that had been submitted to MMS, uh, you will, if you look at the 10-year history of the budget, uh, there had been uh, erosion uh, within the Department of Interior MMS as well as with but, all. But you were proposing well, let me let me let me just yeah, finish with respect to, to the erosion. rest of the other agency agencies within Interior, including MMS, a very significant erosion until we came on board. Now you will but note you will note that the inspectors that are set forth in the budget for MMS are a significant increase from what had been there in the past. Now the question that is appropriate, I think, for this committee and for the Congress, is that number sufficient? And in our view, it is not. We need well, to have again, additional capacity. All I can go is by the budget. I asked if you were there when the decision was made to cut the environmental uh, review uh, activities, which also reviewed uh, permits. And then the next thing is that this is, fe this is February, it came out. In March, uh, did you participate in the decision to expand drilling in the Gulf and other areas? The, uh, Were you the consulted? Is there any documentation? Is it was my, it w not that I was consulted, it was my decision and it was my plan. And it's okay. a plan that I am very, that, that it was a very well thought out plan relative to moving forward in a thoughtful way that changes the direction that we were going on in the OCS that does different things with yeah. respect to what was being planned on the well, Atlantic and, and, the, and, and does different things that was being planned in Alaska and brings in the kinds of environmental reviews that are necessary. Well, again, um, let's go to that, though. You were there when they issued this one-page permit, uh, and this is the permit to drill uh, for BP, one page. This is backed up by a 500-page cleanup uh, spill plan. Uh, I'm sure you didn't review this, um, but you told me that people who were responsible and all were fired and people changed. Uh, have we got that, uh, that organization chart? 
the guy that was responsible for signing this, we've got two people here, uh, Saucier and then Tolbert signed it for uh, Saucier. Uh, he's still, he's still there. Uh, got that circle there, the yellow thing. Uh, so he wasn't fired. He's, he gave carte blanche. This is the approval for BP to drill and the conditions by which they drill. And it refers to a 500 page document. That 500 page document, uh, I, I've, my staff tells me it says it has fill provisions for dealing with a cleanup for seals, walruses, uh, and um, uh, polar bears, none of which I have in the Gulf. It looks like all this was sort of carte blanche approval. It, is, is that what it appears to be? And is this guy going to get fired or anyone uh, uh, and, and, and this guy's still making the decisions. He, this is Saucier, and here, here is Saucier here making the decision on the, uh, implementing the moratorium. Congressman Michael, let me uh, respond uh, with two points. Uh, first, uh, while it is true that there were uh, people who committed uh, both uh, criminal and uh, ethical uh, conduct that is uh, and, and he, wrong. He signed or was well, hold on, let me let me finish. No, no, let me permit. let me finish, Congressman Micah. Yeah. The uh, the reality of it is that uh, there are very there are many good people within the agency. Uh, there are some bad people. Those are being dealt with. With respect to the document that you refer to, and with respect to people that were involved concerning the approvals of the Maconda well and what happened there. Okay. I have asked the Inspector General to take a look at that. And, and the Inspector give, General will provide us their own independent review, which I would be happy to share as appropriate with members of this committee. I'd, I'd appreciate a list and the status of those who were res held responsible. Thank you. Matt, Maybe we could submit that to the committee. Yeah. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, and now you five minutes to the general lady from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the Secretary and to Mr. Bromwich. Um, series of questions. From the outside, there is an ethical crisis at MNS. Whether you change the name or not, there has been a history of drug, sex, rock and roll concerts. And I am concerned, based on the Post article today, that says that there is a much higher degree of revolving door that exists in the oil industry than anywhere else in that three out of every four lobbyists had some relationship to the government. Uh, we know there are 12 former employees of MMS that are now lobbying for the oil industry. Uh, Mr. Brownwich and Secretary, I'd like to know what you're going to do now to freeze out those 12 former employees from interacting with MMS. Well, we, we will certainly make sure that they observe the current ethical rules that exist that restrict their contacts to some extent. Uh, but one of the things I have to do is to gather information from people who have the information. If they happen to be former employees of the agency, I'm not going to exclude them for that reason. But I'm certainly not going to give their information any more weight uh, than anyone else's. I agree. I read the same article you did, and I, I am troubled by it. Um, I, I think what I can tell you and tell the committee that you'll never see me in that position. I'll t say right now uh, that I'll self-impose a lifetime ban on contacts with the agency, and I hope that sets an example for other people in the agency uh, and other people throughout government. I agree it is unseemly. Well, yeah. I guess from our perspective, can you take action independent of Congress passing a bill to restrict former employees from having access to the agency? Well, let me give you an example. I've actually met with two of the former directors who are now part of trade associations uh, within the last couple of weeks. But that was at your request. No, it was, at, it was at their request. But I am in the business right now of trying to gather information from a variety of sources, including from trade associations, because they have relevant information to provide bearing on some of the issues that the secretary and I are working on. I'm going to give them uh, a hearing, but I'm also going to give all other groups, including environmental groups, uh, including. Okay, I understand that. I have a limited amount of time. Okay. So uh, my question was can you act independent of Congress in creating some restrictions uh, around access to the agency after employees have left? Yes, we can, right, but we need you. to do it in a thoughtful way. All right. 
So you'll report back once you've decided on what you're going to do to the committee? Sure. All right. Um, the GAO report to this committee indicated that the revenue share the government collects for oil and gas produced in the Gulf ranks 93rd out of 104 revenue collection regimes around the world. I think most of us find that stunning and shocking. What are you going to do to change that so that the royalties being received from the Gulf are reflective of um, the world as a whole, um, at least the, the, the international average of royalties received around the world? Uh, Congresswoman uh, Spear, let me just say that uh, the royalty issue and getting a fair return to the American taxpayer is uh, foremost in our minds. We have been working on it. Uh, we are working on it. We have proposals to change how royalties are, in fact, collected to make sure that the American taxpayer is getting a fair return for royalties, not only in the offshore, uh, but also on the onshore, where you have a circumstance that probably is even worse, where you still have the same royalty rate uh, that existed since the 1920 Mineral Leasing Act was passed at 12.5 percent. So we are uh, making the kinds of changes that will bring in the right level of royalties and at the same time make sure that there is accountability with respect to, 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 the, to, to the auditing functions related to that. And when will those be put in, into place and do you need congr congressional action to do that? We, we are already working on it. We are moving forward with it. It is uh, being put into place as we speak. The elimination of the royalty and kind program was part of that effort and uh, they are continuing efforts to address the issue. That is good news to hear. Uh, one last question. My understanding, along with uh, Congressman Micah's uh, reference, is that this particular 600-page document was reviewed by two people for a total of 10 hours. So by anyone's measurement, it was inadequate. I don't care if you're a speed reader. Um, there is no way that in 10 hours you can give the kind of attention to that document. What are you doing moving forward to make sure the employees doing that kind of review are both qualified and have adequate amount of time to do the review? With the, the reorganization that we have uh, put on the table, uh, and the resources that we have asked from Congress to be able to do uh, the right kind of work in uh, ensuring safety uh, and ensuring environmental protection uh, should address those issues. The gentlewoman's time, is, the gentlelady's time has expired. I now yield uh, to the gentleman, uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I have a few items on a timeline that lead up to the, uh, the explosion in the oil field and the the uh, oil leak, and um, I'd like to go over those items and, um, and get some of your responses to them. We focus a lot on what happens after the explosion. I'd like to focus on the period leading up to it. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like this, this timeline included in the record. Uh, the timeline begins with January 29, 2009, and the Secretary being declared, uh, the, the Secretary, he's appointed on, on that date, and declares himself the new sheriff in town. That's January 2009. In February of 2009, in a site-specific exploration plan filed by BP, it states that it was, quote, unquote, not required to file a scenario for a potential blowout of the Deepwater Well. March in 2009, as we have a new sheriff in town, the whistleblower, a whistleblower brought forth an issue of a safety breach by BP in the Gulf of Mexico to the attention of MMS. Quote, the whistleblower who was hired to oversee the company's databases that housed documents related to its Atlantis project discovered that the drilling platform had been operating without a majority of the engineer-approved documents it needed to run safely. No action was taken by the agency. But the most important thing was two months after the whistleblower came forward, May 2009, MMS fails to perform a standard monthly inspection of Deepwater Horizon. But what's happening in the Secretary's office, May of 2009, our Interior Secretary is speaking at the Wind Energy Conference in Chicago. June 17, 2009, MMS proposes new rules to require oil and gas operators to develop and implement, quote, safety environmental management systems for offshore drilling. The rule is still not finalized one month and one year later. Um, in June of that same month that these rules were, were provided, um, but not finalized, Secretary Salazar hires Sylvia Baca away from BP America to become his Deputy Assistant Secretary of Lands and Materials Management, according to this timeline. 
Summer 2009, the MS, MMS awards Transocean's U.S. Gulf of Mexico operation a safety award for excellence. And our secretary directs MMS to begin focusing on promoting wind energy. Elizabeth Birnbaum assumes duties as the director of MMS. The New York Times reported that, quote, in particular, she was tasked with handling the politically charged issue of siting the 25-mile Cape Wind Farm off of Cape Cod. But what happens the next month, August of 2009, MMS fails to perform a standard monthly inspection of Deepwater Horizon. August of that same month, White House request, at the White House's request, Secretary Salazar takes a break from your wind energy efforts uh, to begin the big effort of selling health care reform. August of 2009, you travel throughout the West to tout Obama's stimulus plan. I understand from this timeline that on the 21st of August that you were in Grand Canyon South Rim on the highlighting 10.8 million of stimulus dollars, uh, 820 uh, you were at in Utah, 3.6 million of stimulus dollars, and 820 again, you were in Oregon on stimulus dollars. That very next month, the National Oceanographic Oceanic Atmospheric Administration sends MMS a letter about the offshore drilling proposal saying MMS understated environmental impacts of the new drilling proposal. September 8th of that month, uh, Salazar says during an interview at Reuters, right now we are focused on health care reform. In fact, CBS reports November of 2009 that anticipating a struggle, the White House deputized Interior Secretary Ken Salazar and former Sec Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle to join Vice President Joe Biden in trying to clear the way for health care bills overhaul the, uh, reform of the next several weeks. But MMS is busy. MMS has a renewable energy um, task force meeting in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And with all this activity happening in November, what happens in the Gulf in December? December 2009, MMS fails to perform the standard monthly inspection of Deepwater Horizon. Um, they again fail to perform the inspection in January. Um, and then through a series of notifications that BP provides to the agency, um, the, um, the specifications from Deepwater are continued to be adjusted. MMS responding in seven minutes to one request for modification, four and one half minutes to another after having routinely not shown up for standard inspections. And in April, the deep water horizon rig explodes and then sinks. And I believe the secretary is there by April 30th um, after attending on April 27th, um, participating in a ceremony on wind turbines um, April 28th. Um, announcing the approval of the Cape Wind project, and then you're attending um, in the Gulf to take a look at, at what has occurred. G it sounds like a significant amount of inactivity. Gentlemen's time has expired. And I would appreciate your response. I believe my staff has a copy of the timeline, which they can also provide to you. Mr. Turner, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, respond even though the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the fact is the uh, United States Department of the Interior uh, has a major mission to uh, protect and uh, preserve the natural resources of America, both onshore as well as offshore, as well as uh, being the custodian of, of America's history. And in that mission, uh, we work on the set of issues relating to Native Americans and uh, all of the other assignments that we have within the Department of Interior. Specifically, with respect to uh, many of the things that you cite in there, uh, I have spent probably more time on uh, the comprehensive energy program for the nation that uh, the President uh, and I have been championing than on almost any other issue. But I can tell you that within that comprehensive energy plan, which we are confident uh, we will see unfold uh, for this nation, that you will have a broad energy portfolio that will include oil and gas and at the same time include the new energy frontier of solar and wind and geothermal, which we have worked on very hard. Now, I will say uh, this uh, to you, uh, Mr. Turner, that uh, without uh, equivocation, we have spent a huge amount of time with respect to all of the issues relating to MMS, uh, and they have included changing the ethics culture, moving forward with a new direction on the Outer Continental Shelf from what was left over from the prior administration, and moving forward to standing up uh, a renewable energy program. So we work hard, uh, we cover a lot of ground, and uh, we have a lot of ground to cover in the future.
Thank you very much, the gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we know that the blowout preventers failed with BP and, and with enormously tragic consequences. Now, it's my understanding that an inspector does not actually have to witness in person the blowout preventer tests, uh, but can simply review paperwork from the oil company operators and um, they can basically take their word for it. Uh, we know that these tests can be successfully faked uh, as illustrated by several cases. Uh, this practice is um, just unimaginable and it cuts corners and compromises the oversight mechanism and validity of the tests. Um, so how, how will the reorganization of MMS work to improve these inspection practices and what specific improvements do you anticipate making to make this BOP uh, test actually effective? And what are your thoughts about having these types of tests certified as safe by independent third-party inspectors that are selected by federal regulators and not the oil companies? Uh, Congresswoman Chu, uh, it is a very good question and it is something which uh, we have been working on. It really relates to two parts to the reforms uh, within uh, the OCS. And the first of those is having uh, the right standards in place. And many of those uh, standards were set forth in the 30-day report which uh, President Obama directed that I deliver to him. Many of those standards are now being implemented uh, with respect to the notice to lessees that uh, Director Bromwich uh, spoke about a little bit earlier. And then finally, uh, with respect to the enforcement of those standards, there needs to be a significantly beefed up effort with respect to the agency's uh, inspection capabilities because right now it is uh, a fool's errand to think that 60 uh, inspectors can essentially go out and uh, inspect all of the different uh, OCS uh, uh, facilities, including production facilities that are out there. So you will be coming forth with new regulations pertaining to this particular practice? Uh, yes. Um, well, then it uh, leads to another question, which is about new regulations. And um, uh, one of the problems with the current regulatory uh, system is that it takes a long time for any improvements. And in fact, it took nine years for regulations related to pipeline safety to work its way through the process and take effect. So how will the reorganization of MMS work to, to resolve this, this issue of this delayed implementation of new and necessary regulations? Well, the, the, or, the reorganization itself, uh, you'll, there'll be two parts to essentially dealing with the outer continental shelf uh, beyond the revenue side, and one of them will be to manage the resource. The, the other unit will be to provide uh, the safety and enforcement, uh, and uh, we will make sure that we are moving forward to address all the issues uh, and uh, all the lessons uh, to be learned uh, from this tragedy. But my question is, how long will it take? And what, we, what will you do to make sure that, that it's accelerated? Uh, C Congresswoman uh, Chu, I think some people might say that we should have uh, waited for another six months, eight months, uh, until we found out exactly all of the results of all the investigations. Our view from day one has been that uh, we would uh, work on the issue as fast as we can. And so the 30-day report that was delivered to the President is something, is a report that has uh, many rules and requirements and standards which are already being implemented, some of them through notice to lessees and some of them through uh, rulemaking that will be conducted by uh, Director Bromwich. And uh, finally, let me ask this. Um, under De Interior Department regulations, um, oil companies use models developed by MMS to predict the likelihood of oil reaching the shore following a spill. In the Deepwater, uh, deep Deepwater Horizon case, um, these models incorrectly predicted that there was a 0% likelihood of oil reaching most shores in Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana. Um, I mean, it, suge it suggests, of course, that these models are outdated and uh, that the regulations re relating to the oil response plans need to be revisited. So my question is, does MMS need to re-examine all of these oil spill response plans, particularly with regard to these kinds of predictions, which are clearly incorrect wa and way off, and how will the MMS reorganization help this process? The answer is uh, yes uh, on drilling safety and containment measures and oil spill responsibilities, and I would like Director Bromwich to comment on it as well. 
You're quite right, Congress, well, Cong Congresswoman, that, that the oil spill response plans are plainly inadequate. Uh, and that is one subject on which I'm going to be gathering information on the public forums that we're going to be holding uh, over the next month and a half with an eye towards not only insisting in the short term before any new regulations are implemented that those oil spill response plans be substantially revised if they're going to pass muster, but also with an eye towards getting out new regulations in the future. We'll make sure that that's the standard uh, from now on. And you're reviewing all the oil General response plans? Yes. General ladies, time has, Thank you. has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, and let me also wish him happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the honor of sharing a birthday yesterday with the uh, chairman, and uh, he sent me a note saying that he thinks we should make it a national holiday, and that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was a very nice note. Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, thank you for uh, coming here. I've sat through hearings uh, in the Transportation Committee and the Resources Committee on the BP oil spill, and in both of those hearings, uh, the uh, witnesses have mentioned that over 40,000 wells have been um, uh, drilled in the Gulf since 1960, and my staff got uh, some information from your department uh, earlier today saying since 1947, more than 50,000 wells have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's been, it, it's an, it's a, would you not agree it's an astonishing, it's a, almost an astonishingly safe, clean history that, that we have there in the Gulf? I mean, there have been almost no, there's, there's never been anything even close to this BP uh, spill. And in fact, I'm told that there are more spills out of uh, ships than there are from these uh, rigs. I, Congressman Duncan, I, I agree with you, and in fact, I think it was that history of uh, safety over all of those uh, times, 50,000 wells, which essentially was the empirical foundation upon which the national framework has been built uh, with respect to uh, oil and gas production in the Outer Continental Shelf. And I'm told that there are now 3,600 structures in the Gulf right now. Uh, uh, let me, uh, Governor Engler wrote a a column for the Washington Times a few weeks ago, and, he, and the headline says, Drilling Moratorium is a Jobs Moratorium. And he said this, he said, The moratorium immediately shut down 33 deep water rigs in the Gulf, including 22 near, near Louisiana. Uh, this action could cost 3,000 to 6,000 Louisiana jobs in the next two to three weeks, and potentially 20,000 by the end of next year. Uh, for every one employee on an oil rig, there are nine employees on shore supporting that one employee. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's my main concern because not only have I did I read this by Governor Engler, but repeatedly I've seen on the news reports uh, these uh, oil workers um, in the Gulf area uh, almost in a panic uh, situation about all the thousands of jobs that uh, uh, are being uh, destroyed or potentially could be destroyed. Congressman uh, Duncan, let me just say that uh, we too are concerned and uh, we are aware of uh, the issues. Uh, our view and my view in issuing the moratorium is that it was the right way to move forward to put the pause button in place until we can answer three fundamental questions, uh, drilling safety, uh, blowout containment uh, capability, as well as uh, oil spill response capability. If we were to have another blowout in the Gulf of Mexico uh, today or next week, uh, we could not uh, have the oil spill response capability to, to deal with those blowouts. The effort which uh, Exxon and Shell and Chevron and ConocoPhillips came up with uh, yesterday is a beginning point of uh, that conversation relative to how we address one of those three fundamental issues. And Director Bromwich's uh, set of me meetings and hearings around the country will help us answer those three fundamental questions so that we can determine how to move forward with respect to the uh, pause button in place. Charl uh, on another point, Charles Krauthammer, the columnist and commentator who I think almost everybody agrees, even if they don't agree with him, they think he's one of the smartest men in this city. He, he wrote recently, he said, environmental chic has driven us out there. He, he asked the question why we were drilling in 5,000 feet of water in the first place, and he says, Quote, environmental chic has driven us out there. Environmentalists have succeeded in rendering the Pacific and nearly all the Atlantic coasts off limits to oil production. And of course, in the safest of all places on land, we've had a 30-year ban in the Arctic wildlife uh, refuge. 
I have seen articles that say something like 83 or 84 percent of the uh, outer continental shelf is off limits to oil production. Uh, and that, uh, that also is a concern uh, of mine. And, and then finally, before my time runs out, I see the yellow light on, I'll say to Mr. Bromwich, Bromwich, I'm concerned, we've changed the name, and there seems to be a, a goal of emphasizing enforcement. And I'm just wondering, are, are we going to have a gotcha type agency, agency now? Are you going to, uh, because most of these companies, let's, let's forget about BP, let's, let's consider them a bad actor. But most of these companies are doing a, a good job and complying with all the laws. And I agree with you. It's not going to be, we're not going to have a gotcha culture, but we're going to have clear rules and we're going to have aggressive inspections and violations of those clear, clear rules will be dealt with severely. I think that's the right kind of regulatory regime to have. And if you find a violation, are you going to give a company a chance to correct it or are you going to immediately come down on them and just shut them down? That's a very fact-specific determination. We'll have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. All right. Gentlemen's time has expired. And I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, um, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Salazar, um, one of the things that we, uh, you know, I. Uh, head up the, the Coast Guard subcommittee in the uh, tra on Transportation Committee. And the, um, one of the things that we were concerned about is the what role do you all see the Coast Guard playing uh, in the future? Uh, you know, um, the legislation passed by the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure will require a much more significant role for the Coast Guard in the approval of all spill response plans, which is crucial given that the Coast Guard is responsible for managing the response to the spills. So what steps, if any, are uh, MM, MMS and the Coast Guard taking now to strengthen the role of the Coast Guard? And by the way, that's been one of their complaints, that they're asked to be responsible for overseeing the cleanup, but they don't have enough say um, in creating the plan. Uh, did you know that? They've actually testified to that. Either one of Let you. me, uh, Congressman Cummings, if I may, the, the role that we have uh, seen playing out with respect to the response to the Deepwater Horizon blood and uh, the BP oil spill has been one where we have been working uh, hand in hand with uh, Admiral Allen and as a National Incident uh, Commander, um, and uh, we, it's, been, it's been continuous. Uh, you know, we will look back at uh, the Deepwater Horizon tragedy and uh, look at the lessons learned, uh, including uh, uh, the capacities that are out there uh, with respect to the, the Coast Guard and others. But uh, the fact of the matter is that um, the relationship in terms of uh, the structure that has been set up to respond to the oil spill response uh, has worked well between Interior and the Coast Guard and other agencies that are also involved. Well, I've got to tell you, again, um, we've had testimony within, I'd say, the last three weeks, and I will get you that information. Um, where they have told us that they want, and then, this is not Admiral Allen, uh, they want more say in the development of the response, emergency response plan, uh, because they just feel like by the time, if you're going to call on them to oversee the cleanup, they should be more involved in the, in the beginning. So I'll, I'll get that to you. You might want to take a look at that. Uh, Let me I'm just say, Congress you didn't know that. No, I, I, do know, I do know that. Let me just say this, Congressman Cummings. The uh, fact is that the oil spill response uh, issue is one of the three most central issues that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, that issue will necessarily involve, should involve, and will involve, I will make sure that it happens, uh, a, a close collaboration with the Coast Guard because we're not going to move forward until we uh, have uh, a, a assuredness with respect to the adequacy of oil spill response plans. Now, Mr. Secretary, um, although the deep water horizon was registered in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, Captain Hennon, the uh, Deputy Commissioner of Maritime Affairs with the Republic of the Marshall Islands is reported to have testified before the joint MMS Coast Guard panel examining this accident that the RMI as a flag state did not inspect the drilling equipment and systems on the deep water. He reportedly indicated that such inspections are left up to the MMS. 
And we understand that MMS often relies on offshore facility operators to perform key safety tests and that MMS uh, inspectors only review the paperwork associated with the tests. Uh, how is it that uh, adequate, how, is it, how can we make sure that it, uh, we have adequate, um, uh, that is, uh, approval of these, um, of these reports? Uh, because uh, there's a question of inspection that some of the inspections are not actually done by our people, but they're done by the Marshall Allen folk and, and, uh, and people that they contract. So how can we guarantee that those inspections, are, which are so important, uh, are properly done? Let me say first, uh, there were inspections that were conducted at the Deepwater Horizon, uh, including uh, inspections in April and testings, including of the blowout preventer that occurred uh, in the days leading up to, to, to the explosion. Secondly, uh, we will have uh, a, a significantly more robust uh, inspection uh, regime, and it's uh, part of what Director Bromwich uh, will be working on, and he may want to comment on that. No, that, that's absolutely right. That's, that's one of the things we're going to be focusing on uh, most intently. They, they, the, the important inspections can't be paper inspections. They need to be done by human beings, and they need to be done by human beings with experience, uh, demonstrated competence, and an arm's length relationship, at least, uh, to the entities that, that own the facilities. I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, the Secretary has got to leave at 12, and I'm going to try to get in as many members as we can before they have to leave to go to vote. Mr. Burton. Mr. Secretary. Five minutes. Uh, you know, 50,000 wells have been drilled in the Gulf without a problem, and yet the President put a moratorium on the drilling, and uh, as a result, you've had uh, some of the rigs go to uh, Egypt, to the Congo, Brazzaville, uh, in Canada, they're talking about new wells being drilled up to 6,500 feet in the Arctic waters. Uh, so we're going to lose a lot of those uh, rigs, and they probably won't come back, at least not for a long, long time. It makes no sense to me to cut off the drilling in the Gulf when you've not had any real problems except for this one, one catastrophe. And, and I just don't understand why the administration has taken this carte blanche approach. Can you explain that? Congressman uh, Burton, having uh, been involved in this uh, matter in response to the Deepwater Horizon blowout every single day since uh, the blowout, I can tell you that uh, there are three fundamental questions that have to be answered uh, before we take our hand off the pause, pause button, and those are the issues of drilling safety, uh, uh, oil well blowout containment, uh, as well as oil spill response uh, capacities. And that's what we are working on uh, with uh, Director Bromwich, as well as uh, with a whole host of well, other efforts. Well, you've already stated that it, there, there, there's more of a chance of a leak from a tanker than there is from one of these rigs. It, it just doesn't make any sense with a 50,000 drilling of wells in the Gulf, and you have one spill that you're going to cut off everything. And the, and the rigs are already moving to Brazzaville and the Congo. And Brazil, we just sent a billion dollars down to Brazil to help them deal, uh, drill in deep water areas. Uh, and so what we're doing, in effect, is shoving oil production away from the United States. And we're costing us jobs when there is really no reason for it except for this one exception. And what you're talking about, in my opinion, really doesn't make a great deal of sense. Now I want to ask a couple other questions real quick. Uh, I have a... Uh, 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 video I'd like to show to you real quick. It's about 15 seconds long. So can you cue up that video? Uh, Sal Salazar and Napolitano have been on the island two or three times. They've never once come back yep. with us. Um, this is photo ops. Has Lisa Jackson been here? Uh, I don't know. Tina, do you have much contact on the staff level? If not the secretary, is there anybody else? Not with uh, Homeland Security. No, mm -hmm. so, no Sal every time um, Napolitano or Salazar has come to Grand Isle, they go off with some big wigs on a boat or a helicopter or something like that. I, I, they've never met with you know local homeland security. I don't think they've met with the town. Nope. In fact, she drove past me the last time she landed. I was standing at the airport waiting for you to come in, and she drove right past yeah. me. Well, the, the, this is uh, D, Dino Bonanno, who's the homeland security director down there, and the fire chief, Mark Scardino. Scardino. They said that you've never been down to uh, uh, that parish. Uh, and it's one of the most 
toxic areas that's been hit uh, since this spill took place. Why haven't you been down there? Congressman uh, Burton, first of all, I believe that the last count that I saw, I had uh, 11 times that I have been uh, in one of the Gulf Coast states or have in you Houston. Have been to this parish? This I is one of the hardest hit. I, I have been through Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. I, I don't know the exact uh, parish by parish, but let me just say that uh, since April 20th and uh, even before that, I spent a lot of time in the Gulf Coast and I continue to spend a lot of time down there and will. And uh, we'll work relentlessly on this problem until we get it no. fixed and we chart uh, the way this forward. And I will just say, areas. Congressman it Burton. Like this, it seems like this would have been one of the top priorities. I don't understand I mean, why you weren't there. And they were complaining very vigorously that you had ignored their, their problems there. We, the, the, the President, the Vice President, and members of the Cabinet have been down there countless times. My, well, assistant, secretary, the my assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife has, has taken 17 yeah. trips down into that area well, to Mr. deal secretary, with these issues. You're the guy. Uh, you should have been there, in my opinion. Now, the last thing I want to ask is, I know the Jones Act was, uh, was referred to. There were a number of countries that wanted to bring skimmers in as soon as this thing took place. We could have eliminated an awful lot of these ecological problems if those skimmers had been brought in. Why in the world didn't we let all these other countries bring those skimmers in as quickly as possible? Uh, Mr. Burton, I disagree with you. Uh, the fact is the Jones Act has not kept a single vessel well, from coming why into the, the country, in? number one. Uh, we have the shortage of, uh, of, of skimming vessels has not been an issue, and the why Jones Act has not been a vessel. From other countries? Why weren't they allowed in? They were brought in as uh, they were required, and uh, Thad Allen and the National Incident Commander After have been in charge of The gentleman's, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Dryhouse, five uh, thank minutes. You, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my intent wasn't to rebut my Republican colleagues in this hearing, but given what was just said uh, about the exception uh, of this disaster, it's like suggesting that 9-11 was an exception to air traffic control regulations and that we shouldn't react to that. The fact is this has been an environmental disaster. And the fact is that we should look at the regulation appropriately of oil wells in the Gulf. And I think it's very appropriate that the administration take the steps that it has to make sure that all of the wells are safe. Uh, I further heard my Republican colleagues suggest that it's limitations on onshore drilling and other parts of the country that is driving BP and others to go to the Gulf. I assume that they're making money in the Gulf that the reason we have all these wells in the Gulf is because there's oil there and they're making money. Is that correct? That is correct. And so the reason that BP and, it, and the other oil companies are in fact drilling is because they're making a profit in the Gulf. That is correct. I, I'd like to move on. And, and I think the issue here is, is one that's important. And it, and it dates back to the 2005 Energy Act and the, ca the issue of categorical exclusions. Um, I'm concerned, as are others. Um, with regard to the number of categorical exclusions that we have seen uh, for wells in the Gulf. And I, I would appreciate if you would help us better understand uh, how categorical exclusions are determined and whether or not BP advocated aggressively for categorical exclusions for its drilling operations in the Gulf. Uh, Congressman, uh, let me just say, uh, first of all, but just back on the moratorium, I, it is a prudent position that we have taken, and, and I appreciate uh, the support that you echo for that moratorium because of these fundamental issues that we do need to have addressed. Uh, secondly, with respect to your uh, the question on, on categorical exclusions, they appear at a time when after, after significant environmental uh, analysis has been done because the process is that in developing a five-year plan, you do an environmental impact statement. Uh, before you issue, uh, a, have a lease sale, there is another environmental impact statement that is reviewed. So there are a series of reviews that happen. Now, the categorical exclusion in part in the Gulf of Mexico, which have been granted to more than BP, uh, those occur in large part because there is a 30-day window of, uh, of approval required by statute when an exploration plan itself is filed as part of the leasing and development process. And so we have asked uh, the Congress to extend that 30-day uh, window to a 90-day window, and, and I, I hope that it is something that you enact in the uh, oil spill legislation that is before you. When, when you say that 30-day window is in statute, when was that 30-day window implemented, and why was it implemented? Why was it only 30 days, and who advocated for the 30-day window? I do not 
don't uh, have the specifics on uh, when that uh, requirement was put into into the law, but I can get that for you. Uh, do you believe? Yeah. What What is your opinion as to how long it should be for for the review? You, you said 90 days. Is 90 days appropriate? Um, with 30 days, I believe is uh, is too short, and I do think that uh, what we need to do, especially in places like the Gulf of Mexico, you have tremendous environmental information and reviews that have already been conducted, and so we just need to make sure that the environmental reviews that are being uh, conducted are, uh, are 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 worthwhile, and uh, that uh, we're doing the right thing in terms of the aim of uh, the environmental analysis, which is to understand what impacts there will be to the environment from uh, the activities. Do you believe that there's been an overuse of categorical exclusions uh, under the previous administration and, um, and the 30-day window is a primary cause of that? Uh, I do believe that there was uh, an over uh, use of the categorical exclusions and indeed with respect to what we have already done on the onshore under the Bureau of Land Management is uh, we have changed that practice and uh, obviously we are now conducting a comprehensive review with uh, the Council of Environmental Quality relative to the environmental reviews and changes that need to happen with respect to OCS. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I know we're about to go to votes, and Secretary Salazar, you've been great to spend so much time with us. I, I appreciate your measured response to Mr. Burton's question. Um, I think we could be here. Uh, for days on end if we were going to play videos of single individuals who were upset that one particular federal official didn't visit them. Um, I think we're very lucky to have you in this position. Uh, so many of us have been impressed by your uh, immediate and robust response to this mm -hmm. tragedy. Uh, and Mr. Bromwich, uh, you have a reputation as a, a, a no-nonsense administrator in everything you've done, um, and I think you're the right guy for the job. Um, I just have a couple quick questions. Um, one relevant to funding sources moving forward. Um, the reorganization, as you split into three different entities, is going to require more people in and of itself, three directors, maybe three offices of congressional relations. We know that we need more uh, people to do, uh, uh, to do the inspection work. Um, as you look down the road at how you think uh, the agency should be funded and you look at uh, a, a potential diminishing reliance on royalty payments, um, how do you expect that um, moving forward, the new functions of these agencies are going to be funded. Uh, Congressman Murphy, thank you for your, uh, for your comments. Um, we are in the midst of uh, working uh, with uh, the appropriators uh, in developing uh, the budget amendments to make sure that uh, the funding is, is there to be able to do the job. Uh, the funding sources themselves and uh, where they will come from, that will be part of that discussion that we will engage with, uh, with Congress on. And with respect to royalty payments, do you um, have ideas today as to what components will be continue to be funded by royalty payments or what components you no longer want to be funded with respect to royalty payments? That is uh, part of the review that we currently have uh, underway in the implementation programs that we are developing. Um, and, and maybe I'll direct this question to Mr. Bromwich, but be happy to have the Secretary weigh in as well. Um, one of the things that has been of great frustration to us is the technology that we're using right now to deal with this bill and the fact that we've had a, you know, a, a fairly slow pace of innovation within the industry in developing new technologies to address spills. Um, maybe it's moving a lot faster right now as we speak, but over a long period of time it's been relatively slow given the threat. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you foresee um, either within your agency or in uh, or in putting pressure on the industry, um, how do we more quickly advance oil spill um, disaster mitigation technology, oil spill response technology going, uh, going forward? Yes, it's a very good question. I think one of the things that this disaster has focused people's attention on generally is the lack of advances in containment technologies as well as in oil spill response technologies. Uh, that's not only been recognized by Secretary Salazar and me and many others, it's been recognized by players in the industry. And I think that's one of the uh, reasons why yesterday we saw the, the four largest majors come forward with uh, the outlines of a plan to deal with containment, oil spill containment in the Gulf of Mexico. I think that, that this disaster has focused people's energies. It will stimulate uh, innovation. Uh, we'll obviously be directly involved in that process. 
Uh, the proposal that was made yesterday uh, is an interesting one. It's an intriguing one, but we're going to want to review and study it carefully. We'll ask for more elaboration on it by the companies. It's, it's one that not only we, but you and the American public is going to need to have confidence in. Mr. Issa for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one, one quick question. Uh, would you, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, that your decision was by definition for six months of a moratorium arbitrary. In light of what you said earlier today, would you say that resources that are freed up at the time of the kill of this well could just as easily be the end of the moratorium as you said earlier, clearly there were resources that you didn't want to have not available if something on one in 50,000 wells happened a second time. But wouldn't a target of the killing of this well be just as appropriate for considering limited, well-supervised uh, roll, rolling back into exploration of the existing 22 rigs? Uh, Congressman. Uh I appreciate your observation and I also appreciate the sense of uh, urgency that you have that these issues be addressed. Uh, but let me say there is a tremendous amount of work that is unfolding. I will have uh, a report back uh, from uh, the Oversight Safety Board, which I established, which includes great work from the Inspector General and her staff that are focused in on uh, some of these safety issues. That is due, I believe, on uh, August the 15th. The National Academy of Engineering arm of the National Academy of Sciences will have an interim report for me by October the 31st. And obviously the multiple investigations that are underway are informing us. So if there is a point in time uh, between now and November 30th where the three fundamental questions that I, I have already addressed are addressed to our satisfaction, we will revisit uh, that timeline for the moratorium. I appreciate that. I yield the balance of time, Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us today, Mr. Bromwich. Uh, this oil spill is an environmental catastrophe. BP was a reckless actor, and clearly all of us must work together to ensure three things, that this leak is continued to be stopped, that the environment is cleaned up, and that we work uh, with all the resources we have to ensure that this never happens again. In that regard, I think Mr. Ice has made a reasonable point, and you have answered it reasonably, that for your reasoning for the moratorium is that our resources are currently deployed and perhaps depleted, and in case there was a second spill or catastrophe like this, we would not have the resources to work against it. But given that there is the potential for this leak to be permanently stopped in the near term, your consideration of that factor in terms of the moratorium deadlines, I think, is reasonable. The second point, though, being um, given that the resources that are applied are under intense pressure to potentially move overseas and that this would cause more imported oil to come into our waters, more tankers, which are inherently more environmentally dangerous <coughs> than the drilling itself. Is the moratorium timeline potentially more risky? A related point is that all drilling is not the same. Now, BP was clearly engaged in the riskiest type of drilling. There is partial drilling, there is development drilling. Uh, is there a consideration that those may be exempted as well, given that their risk profile is lower? Uh, Congressman, the answer to that is, uh, is uh, yes, and that is part of what uh, Director Bromwich uh, will be uh, gathering information on. There may be different activities uh, and different zones of risk uh, that might be allowed uh, to go forward. We have already made one of those findings with respect to the shallow water uh, drilling, and there may be others as uh, we move forward. So a segmentation of risk, risk profiling based upon the actual uh, historical past, uh, 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 the historical analysis of risk based upon the type of drilling rather than a blanket moratorium. There, there may be, for example, Congressman, uh, you know, the, the differentiation between uh, the exploration wells in the deep water and uh, uh, wells that are being drilled into uh, already de uh, developed uh, reservoirs where you know exactly what it is that you are drilling into uh, as opposed to 
the, uh, the, the exploratory type of wells, which the Maconda well was one. And so those are the kinds of distinctions that uh, we will be taking a look at in, in the months ahead. Well, I think the last thing we want to do is increase pressures for more imported oil, which puts more tankers into our water, which, again, traditionally has been more of a high, or has a higher environmental risk of spillage than the drilling operations. With that said, I also would like to point out that I visited the area recently, one of the coastal communities. These people are exhausting themselves trying to save their land, save their way of life, and save the environment. I think you've heard. Time has expired. I had a good video for you, Ms. Secretary, but we'll have to do it another time. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, and I uh, thank uh, Secretary Salazar and Mr. Brownwich for your, your testimony. The uh, devastation of the BP oil spill has highlighted many problems in worker safety and containment and oversight. Uh, but it has especially highlighted the mismanagement of the MMS, the Minerals and Management Service Agency, which if managed appropriately could literally bring in millions if not billions uh, to our Treasury from oil extracted uh, from land owned by the American people. Under, under the uh, current structure, the General Accounting Office has found that the MMS uh, should do a great deal more to improve the accuracy of the data used to collect and verify the oil royalties. I, I have a bill in H.R. 1462 which would require the National Academy of Engineering to study and come forward with uh, uh, improvements and recommendations of ways that we could more accurately collect uh, the royalties on the production of oil. I would like, uh, Mr. Secretary, if you would review it, and certainly this could be helpful in, in defining it in a way that we could be uh, more successful in, in uh, giving the American people, the taxpayers, their, their just uh, reward or their just tax revenues or their rep revenues from this oil. According also to the General Accounting Office report that was given to this committee, the revenue share uh, that the government collects from oil and gas produced in the Gulf ranks 93rd among the lowest of the 104 revenue collection uh, regimes around the world. Is that an accurate statement? Are we 93rd in collection? I have not, I cannot comment on that uh, statistic, but I will say this, that we have uh, been implementing uh, many of the recommendations from the General Accounting Office uh, as well as uh, recommendations that came forth uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Kerry um, uh, Garns Commission that addressed many of these issues. And at the end of the day, what we're looking at is to achieve the objective which you outlined, which is to make sure that we're getting a fair return back to the American taxpayer, and we'd be delighted to take a look at your bill. Did you testify earlier that this has not been updated since the 1920s in your, in your statement? Uh, no, I did not. The, the, that was a referral to the royalty rate that is established under the 1920 Mineral Leasing Act with respect to onshore uh, oil and gas leasing, and uh, that is something which we have been reviewing and do believe it should be changed. So that has not been updated since the 1920s. We certainly should look at that and bring it into the uh, 21st century. Uh, also, the, the GAO report uh, reported that uh, MMS does not audit oil and gas company royalty numbers. Is that correct at this point? That was the GAO report. Yeah, there are auditing functions that uh, do occur, and in fact, that's why we go back and uh, do collections uh, from, from, from companies where they have underpaid, and that uh, does happen on an ongoing basis. But as I said, we are in the process of uh, implement, implementing uh, numerous recommendations that have come uh, from GAO, uh, the several commissions, as well as uh, recommendations from our Inspector General. But uh, is it fair to say that we could be under collecting by millions, possibly billions, in this, uh, in this uh, royalty program? I think it is fair to say that uh, there is uh, under collection that is uh, taking place, and uh, it really revolves around uh, two key issues. Uh, one of them is uh, the measurement. Uh, relative to uh, the oil and gas that's being produced against which uh, the royalties are being levied. 
and secondly, the uh, royalty uh, level itself and whether or not that is uh, the appropriate royalty level. And uh, that's what my, my bill would look at, to look at more accurate measurements and, and uh, compare with other countries. Um, also, in, in the, uh, <laughs> they're calling me to a vote, uh, but, but this is an important area and we, we need to uh, move into the 21st century. Why in the world are we rated uh, so low, 93rd in the world, in, in the royalty payments coming from the Gulf? And did you testify earlier that you had written BP for royalty payments of uh, five billion? Is that what you said? No, there was a, uh, a, uh, an underpayment uh, by BP uh, with respect to onshore activities uh, in the West. The royalty program now in effect in uh, the How Gulf much was their underpayment? The gentlewoman's time has expired. Can, can you answer that question? May I ask for it? As, as I recall, uh, and it's been several weeks ago, I think for that particular issue is about $5 million. $5 million. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Salazar, I announced uh, that you had to leave at uh, noon, and uh, I will abide by that and not even ask my own question. I know that you understand uh, as a former member of Congress when bells ring, but I know I speak for the chairman when I thank you and Mr. Bromwich for a very important testimony here today. Uh, the hearing is in recess until after the vote. Thank you. Thank you.